Good uh, again. If you don't know, dear viewer, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you might be in the world. But that took forever to start. Absolutely forever. Well, here we are, a, 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 a medium-sized group this evening. Uh, we're still waiting for one more, so we'll so we'll jump directly to Josh, Josh Searing of the company uh, of Green, uh, which is, if you've been around a while now, you know that's kittyhawk.io. And um, kittyhawk.io today have launched the next generation of enterprise compliance and planning solutions with kittyhawk dynamic airspace. Now that sounds like a load of marketing ball to me. What does that mean, Josh? Well, first of all, guilty as charged, I have been called a marketer before. But ultimately, <laughs> Kitty Hawk Dynamic Airspace is really about the fundamental shift that we've seen in the UAS industry from people needing to know the sectional or the map or the airspace and needing to know things about their company that were specific to it. So, for example, we found that we have enterprise customers that want to overlay evacuation routes or information about the infrastructure that they're flying next to. For example, how tall is that tank? Which way do we go if there's a problem? Which way is the traffic going to be flowing if we need to make an emergency egress? We have folks that are in the rail industry that are going to put in all of the railroad tracks that they manage into their airspace application. So now it's not just about what's your airspace, where are you operating? It's your data on top of the airspace, and it makes for what we call Kitty Hawk Dynamic Airspace. Okay, yes, I, I, I must admit, I hadn't thought of it like that, but of course, in the modern world, I think when I read your your press release, I was sort of thinking, well, this is this is sort of damning one of my favourite things, which is the aviation, not a damning, but, you know, saying we've got to change the way we work with aviation charts, and of course, you're absolutely right. <laughs> it's a modern world. Um, so so I've got that then. I am rail, big railway company A, and I, I got my routes that I always do my surveys. So that the controlled airspace and stuff where aircraft work, that isn't really going to change, is it? So I guess once, once I've set this up, then I've got a big workflow for opening up my clearances as I move down a route or something like that. I mean, is my head going the right way? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, now that Kitty Hawk is a UAS service supplier and we're able to offer Lance authorizations, one of the things that we've done to customize the airspace right away is be able to show you the Lance authorizations that you have currently and that are upcoming on your map and your airspace. So now it's not just, hey, this is controlled airspace. This is controlled airspace, and here's the authorization that you've been granted to fly in. It's not really valuable to anybody else, but to you, it's super valuable. You want to be able to see and visualize all of that data in one spot, particularly if you're an enterprise operator. And that, um, the, so that authorization is something that uh, that the air traffic agency within that uh, LANC grid or Lance LANC uh, grid uh, it will will know. So that's that's what's happened in the background as you're flying and rolling forward. Uh, the, the the app has got your authorization. Is that about right? Yeah, so this really lets us, it gives us the freedom to innovate. Now that airspace is a core competency at Kitty Hawk, we're going to be able to bake in a lot of features with your airspace. So, for example, if you wanted to make a geofence so that you didn't fly over a certain area or you wanted to particularly fly in a certain area, you could easily do that using Kitty Hawk Dynamic Airspace in the near future. So we're being very careful to say, now this gives us the opportunity to innovate on all of the different things we know that we can do with this data in one spot. And part of the other big feature here is that it's ubiquitous across the platform. So you have the airspace available to you on the desktop and available to you on the mobile devices just as easily. Now, I, I, I notice you keep saying your airspace. It's not really my airspace or your, your airspace, is it? Well, we think that airspace is going to be customized. So if you have, for example, in the States here, we have a COA, Certificate of Authorization. Technically, that would be your airspace when you are operating within that COA. So we think of it as personalized airspace. But make no mistake, Kitty Hawk is in favor of federal preemption. We think the national airspace is a something everybody should be able to have access to. And that's one of the reasons why we offer Lance authorizations to the public for free. You are able to get those at no charge through Kitty Hawk. And we think that we want more drones in the sky, more people operating, and safe, safely operating. So, well, how does that work then? So, I've got, uh, I've, I've got my smartphone, I've got your app, and I want to fly in the centre of town B. Um, how does that work then? How do, how do I get to that point of getting that authorization? So, the 
the long and short of it is we show you a map. We ask you to draw the area in which you're going to be operating. We then check to make sure that all of the rules are being adhered to. Is it daytime? Is it less than 55 pounds? You're going to go less than 100 miles an hour. And then if all of those criteria are met, we go knock on the FAA's door and we say, hey, we have a person here who meets the criteria. They'd like to fly in controlled airspace. Is it okay? And if it's okay, the FAA comes back with an authorization. And then we show you that authorization readily available on the map for your personal operations. And I'm not being in America, I wouldn't have any experience of it. Would would the uh, would would the FAA machine come back and say, well, not now, but if you can wait ten minutes, you'll be okay? Or is it just a blanket no, and then you reapply? So we actually offer something called further coordination required, and what this means is you can say you can go to a place where the FAA says, no, you cannot fly here, and say, I'd like to fly here. And if they're able to accommodate you, the appropriate entity will get back in touch with you and actually be able to offer you that authorization if you're willing to comply with whatever their requirements are. So it offers the ability to start a dialogue and a conversation about operating in places that once were completely off limits. But we're talking about something here that is... Have I done this in advance? Have I, before I've gone flying, like an hour before, have I done this or have I turned up on site and am I doing it? We accommodate ad hoc reservations as well as reservations up to 90 days in advance. So it's really easy to be able to know that you're going to go fly somewhere and get the authorization in advance or if you just need to go out because you've been called out to go work on something or get some information, that's easily available to you as well. Well, I'm assuming if you're a smart cookie, you're going to do it 90 days in advance or whatever to make sure you've got it squared away and and or if there is a problem have that amount of time to work on that problem we actually see kind of a bifurcation amongst our enterprise customers so folks who do like insurance claims we have a lot of insurance companies using kitty hawk to manage their drone operations they turn up on site because they don't know where the next tree is going to fall or lightning is going to strike but we have other folks thinking you know energy or oil and gas that they always fly in the same area. They know when they're going to fly. They understand their operations very, very precisely. And so, yeah, they oftentimes will get reservations far in advance. And they'll roll, yeah, and then then they'll just see it again, and that, that'll be a rolling thing that goes on. So I suppose the question I have to ask is, obviously, is, is all of this private? Can I, can I see what my competitor is doing by some, some sort of notification of their flights? So right now, this is all private. Your airspace data is your airspace data. It doesn't go anywhere else. But we're working on ways, like, for example, our participation in the inter-USS wing program to be able to share telemetry responsibly with other cooperating op operators so that you're able to be fully informed of the situation that you're working inside. Uh, so, just, sorry. Kind of, uh, it's a kind of ADSB or integration with the ADSB-like systems, like the, the new drone ID that is being promoted uh, by Intel? So Kitty Hawk favors a network-based remote identification solution. We think this gives all the benefits of broadcast with a far bigger operational picture. Um, but yes, that this is similar to those types of technologies, but instead of using a piece of hardware to send out a signal, we're using the GPS and the internet to be able to convey that information. And so you, you've, when you say all, the, so you, you've now mapped all the airspace. You are a person. There are other um, people available for getting airspace information, uh, but now it's in house. You're, you're doing this yourselves. So this is now a core competency. Kitty Hawk gets the airspace data directly from the FAA. We display it in our own proprietary format. We add in your enterprise data on top to make it extra useful for you. And this is something that we're looking forward to developing even further into a whole new set of features and products. So I've got to ask, I suppose, a slightly controversial question. Where's the check and balance on the quality of the data? Because in the past, there have been uh, purveyors of airspace data where the airspace data has been absolutely awful. I know you're a pilot yourself, so you've got a bit of a vested interest in making it right. So, um, yeah, how do we know the data is good? That's a great question. So we worked through the Kitty Hawk engineering process to make sure that we're pulling the data from the FAA, which is the authoritative source, and that we're updating it and refreshing it um, as required in the timeframes that they've set forth, which is for some of them 56 days, for others it's 64 days, but we're making sure that that data is fresh and continuously available. For example, our temporary flight restrictions are updated on the order of minutes. 
So if there is a, for example, VIP presidential movement TFR, we'll know about it within minutes of it happening and going into effect. Well, I don't know. Throw, I'll, I mean, let's just quickly go to the comments before I go to further so, down there. So, one question. How does this integrate with uh, general aviation? Will they have to be also subscribers of your platform because we are only speaking on Class G air, airspace? Or uh, do you guys also cover the other classes of airspace? That's a great question. So, I just want to make sure we're not conflating the two. This is dynamic airspace. It is not a remote identification solution. The important part here is that they tie together. Dynamic airspace with remote identification provides a more complete operating picture for everybody. So it doesn't interface with general aviation specifically. It has a lot of use for being able to in the future. Though. So, but if I own an helicopter and I get the TFR for operating below 400 feet, how do, uh, is it registered and displayed on your uh, app? Yes, if the FAA grants you a temporary flight restriction, we'll have that data within minutes of it going live, and it will be in all of the apps as well as the website. Just, yeah, so it's no tan system, really, I suppose. I'm just going to jump to the comments quickly, because FPV Steve said, I feel like this should have no bearing whatsoever on the hobby. We're falling into the trap of allowing ourselves to be regulated where none is required for our purposes. We should be fighting that. I, I don't think what Joshua's uh, uh, talking about is, <laughs> is necessarily asking for regulation, but I can see it making, a, a, uh, making it easier for commercial operators. But if just I... Just to be clear... Go on. Kitty Hawk, supports, Kitty Hawk supports the hobby. I'm a modeler myself. The reason I get to have the best job in the world is because I was a modeler growing up and I love model aviation. We are working to keep the national airspace safe for everybody and we want to enable hobbyists to have their time to play. And we want people to be able to go to work. We're working on building the industry alongside the company. We are not trying to box anybody out or be overly regulatory. Yeah, and I, I think uh, what I was going to say is to, to sort of fall in line with what Steve says, I, I think there is a bit of a rush uh, from some quarters to to nail stuff down, and we are being dragged along. I don't know, um, and we should welcome David Merrill as well from uh, Elroy Air, uh, who's also arrived on the scene. Uh, we'll have a chat with you in a second. Um, Bruce, did, what's your take on having yet another system uh, that we can log into? Well, I mean, you, you have, you're spreading things pretty thin, but um, this does integrate with Lance, which is obviously means that you've got access to two systems through the one system, which is is, is handy. But what I'd like to know is uh, what kind of APIs have you got to allow third party integrators to use your service? Or are you going to be basically just a turnkey, take it or leave it service? Are you, are you going to make it open to other people to, to use some of the functionality you're providing through your apps, uh, through their apps? Yeah, one of the things that we're most excited about is being able to offer the Kitty Hawk Airspace API. One of our 2019 goals is to make sure that our API is so robust that no matter what you want to do within Kitty Hawk, whether it's consume the information or place the information, you're able to do that quickly and easily. We're a developer first company. We're software nerds who love aviation. So absolutely, the API is out there. We're happy to talk to people about doing integrations. We're excited to be able to offer this brand new product. So just we a quick question. question. Uh, Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, yeah. What's the business model? Where does this, where does this pay for itself? Who, you know, how do people pay for the service? So we're working with some enterprise customers. That's our our base is people who service who are enterprise customers with drone programs. So really large companies that are for the first time giving drones to people who are not classically trained aviators. This is the first time in history you can be a pilot without being an aviator. You take on all of the responsibility of operating in the national airspace, but your butt is not in the seat. It's a very, very high bar to clear in terms of compliance and safety. That's the problem that Kitty Hawk is solving. So yes, our app is free for individual operators and hobbyists, but when it comes time to have a huge drone program in an enterprise, we help companies manage groups of people flying fleets of drones and doing it safely and compliantly is our core focus. So the business model is not to screw the little guy and start charging airspace taxes and really you know, doing all of these kind of things that are going to inhibit the industry. We want to enable the industry. We want more flights. So uh, just a question. Uh, how do uh, 
for instance, a project, an open source project like Ardu Pilot would integrate with uh, Kitty Hawk through the ground station, through the vehicle, um, or just using your app. Because from what I saw now on, on uh, Google Shop, uh, it, it says Kitty Hawk for DJI and a UAV. So perhaps the, the description is not right. You know, that's a, great, that's a great question. And I think, most importantly, number one, we support open source efforts. I'm a long time open source software user. I grew up running OpenBSD. We commit to various open source projects and give back to the community. Ultimately, we need to go where the market is. And we don't yet have a lot of enterprises running Ardu Pilot. We're looking forward to finding a reason to integrate with that. I love open source projects, and I think it would be awesome if you could open Kitty Hawk and fly any Ardu Pilot enabled drone. We're just waiting for the use case for that to be possible. Most of the enterprises aren't building their own drones. They would love to run open source software, but they don't want to put it all together themselves. So we're looking where the market is going. At the end of the day, this is a business. I love supporting open source software, but we need to make sure that we're building for the market as it exists today. So but the, the question is, will, uh, would uh, the, the ground station software that is used uh, extensively, like Q-Ground Control or Mission Planner, uh, be the, the primary customers of your API, or would the drone be the customer of your of the API? Like I said, when we have a customer who's going to pay us to figure that out, we're happy to do it. We okay. have all kinds of integrations possible. We can do on the chip, we can do API, we can do in the software. It's really just a matter of what's best and what's going to work for our customers. So what's so, your competitive advantage in the marketplace? Because obviously other people are looking at this and going, hey, that's a good idea. Why don't we integrate it into our stuff? Maybe Airmaps will do it. Who knows? Um, so what are you doing to basically keep competition at bay? Because obviously, as a business, you've got to make sure that you have some kind of uh, advantage over your competitors. Our competitive advantage is a laser beam focus on servicing enterprise customers, building their drone teams alongside them, helping them scale the number of flights, and moving faster than anybody else. We're innovating, and we're working hard to make sure that this industry takes off, to use a bad pun. And we're understanding what needs to happen in what order, and we're building those things. Kitty Hawk is ready for the next generation of drones, and we're working on that solution today. So what's our competitive advantage? It's really understanding the market, building for the customers that we have, and building solutions for the customers that we're going to have. Now, as a free user, uh, if, if I were, I think you just said it's free, free now. Um, and I think that we need just to understand where you came from, which is more of a, uh, uh, you're going to hate me for saying this, more of a, a flight logging and a hardware um, sorting out solution, you know, keeping a track of what's where, what's happening and all that sort of thing. And this is built on top of that. So if I were to go out and use it now, because perhaps in South Africa, it wouldn't do a lot of good for me right now, because perhaps you don't have South African airspace. Um, but, but I could at least use it as a logging tool, a record-keeping tool. Uh, anyway, I've ranted. Over to you. You tell me if I was right. Certainly. So what we've been doing, and this is, I think, unlike a lot of other drone companies, is we're building as the market requires things. Rather than trying to get way out ahead and say, look, we've solved the problem. Here it is. Go use this solution. We're building things as our customers need them. So as remote identification has become important, we've committed ourselves to building a best-in-class remote identification solution. As our customers have asked for further integration and more compliance, we've created solutions to let them know more and have increased transparency on their operations at scale. So yeah, we did start as a flight logging platform, but the notion was always, if we're going to have drones in the national airspace, we need to treat them like real aircraft. That was the impetus for this tool, and that's the solution that we're building today. Okay, well, that's grand. I'm just going to drop uh, into the comments. Osby Drone mentioned a, a shooting down incident in, in Australia, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But we'll bring, if I can bring David in, please stay with us, Josh. If I can bring David in now uh, from Elroy Air, who has, well, he's going to have a platform that you, that, that's going to need uh, some system like yours, Josh, really, uh, a large delivery drone. So congratulations on the investments that came came your way there, David. And uh, Thanks. And doubly congratulations for being, as far as I can tell, one of the few uh, delivery companies actually considering larger <laughs> deliveries, not one kilo or 50 grams or whatever. Um, and I'm quite interested to know why you, why you thought you'd leap in at that sort of a size. 
Sure. Um, well, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, to your question, um, basically we recognized, so my co-founder Clint Cope and I were talking about ideas before we started the company and looking at the technology availability in the market, um, like something that we really enjoy doing is taking a look at enabling tech and figuring out what can now be built that couldn't have been built recently. Um, and so we were excited by all the all the new um, companies getting into the air taxi market, and that looked really thrilling. And when we took a look at the technical diligence, we realized, wow, there's nothing that's missing from this picture. Like all the right pieces of the technology stack are either here today or coming into focus pretty quickly. There's nothing that's gonna be five, 10 years out on the technology side. Um, but at the same time, pretty quickly, we, we recognized that um, the regulatory could be a bigger challenge that might take longer. And so early in the cycle of figuring out where we could add value in this market, we came to the conclusion that there's a big need for cargo systems that are heavier than that, you know, couple kilograms that you mentioned. And also there's, you know, the, the market of small delivery drone systems was already starting to, fill up with other competitors. And so we felt like there's a gap in the larger, I would call it maybe mid, mid-sized payload because there are also you know, aircraft, autonomous aircraft systems being developed that are the size of jumbo jets. Uh, but in the mid payload space, the technology was there, not many people were doing it. And we felt like that's a, that's a path to market where we can deliver something that really adds value to the world and it's likely to, to get through the regulatory hurdles faster than if we were trying to carry passengers. Yeah, no, absolutely. I've been rant, one of my persistent rants is, well, let's let's move 500 kilos of car, cargo around for a couple of thousand hours before we start putting people on board. It's just, <laughs> just it just strikes me as, as, as the fairly obvious thing to do. Um, and there's quite a lot of risk in standing up an air taxi or urban air mobility vehicle. Um, so 500 still... kilos, Gary, 500 kilos is an air taxi, right? Yeah, but if, you, if, if, if you haven't got people in it for a while, let's just move 500 kilos worth of, of widgets around before pizza. we start. Pizza, pizza. 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 Yeah. that'd be a lot of pizza, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would Feed, be a the lot of pizza. Feed the poor. Feed the poor. It's in the world pizza. Yeah. So, so when we when we looked at the kind of risk profile of different vehicles operating at this scale, we thought, well, you know, moving people on board, yes, of course, that's the most precious cargo. And then the business model for air taxi requires operation in densely populated urban metros for the most part. So you've also got, uh, you know, a ground, you know, on the ground underneath those flights is going to be some of the most densely populated cities. So, you know, I, I consider that like the, the double black diamond safety case for larger aerial autonomous aerial systems. And so exactly to your point, Gary, we looked at it and said, well, we can build a business where number one, there's no people on board. Number two, we can start in pretty remote areas where there's very little risk to anybody on the ground and actually build a business that starts there. We'll show a track record. We'll build up that, build up those flight logs and then over time, work our way back toward the urban centers once we've shown that safety case. And so, I think that's it. Quick question, David. Uh, what is your payload estimate for top of the payload? Antonov right. or C5A Galaxy sized payloads? Right, right. so not, not quite the 500 kilos that you mentioned, uh, Gary, but we're designing yeah. for 225 kilograms, which is about 500 pounds, and a 500 uh, kilometer range. So if you've got an, an operation where you're going out and back uh, before refueling the system, you've got a 250 kilometer radius of operations. Um, our system, so we're designing specifically for cargo um, and for, for longer range than, than an electric system would permit. So pretty early on, we also decided that this system had to be hybrid electric. So it's basically electric for vertical flight and then goes into fixed wing driven by an internal combustion engine for cruise flight. Um, and that's how we get the range that is about 10x what we modeled when we did the calculations on all electric 
uh, system. And do you need what kind of infrastructure do you need on the takeoff and landing points? Uh, really, just you know, the uh, a clear space the size of a helipad. Okay. Now that's, yeah. that's interesting. You you said the size of a helipad. I have got a video in the can, sort of. Um, because I've noticed this uh, last couple of weeks that vertiport has become very much a word and lots of mm -hmm. issues of old popular mechanics seem to spring to mind with the things I see. So I've done a little bit of um, reading about uh, helipads, one and a half times the width of the aircraft and all that sort of a thing. Um, is that one of the, uh, particularly for urban air mobility, is this actually going to be one of the the, the, the risks of, for success of, of these air taxis? Uh, are, is there really the available space in the city and the num and the actual number of mm -hmm. people they need to make a profit, I wonder? I'm ranting a bit. I'll let you try and answer my rant, David. Sure. Um, so I think, there, I think the real estate is there because some cities already have pretty dense populations of helipads. Um, Accessing them is maybe another story because there are also cities like here where we are in San Francisco where helicopter takeoff and landing has been all but prohibited. I think that the hospital is the only active helipad uh, here in San Francisco in our neighborhood. And that's mostly because um, the residents have complained about noise and visual blight as, as something they, they don't want. They don't want, you know, proliferation of helicopters. But um, if you look at, you know, like the big cities in Brazil already have a lot of helicopter transport happening every day. Um, and this, just the space on top of buildings is already getting, starting to be developed. I think the first example is popping up in Texas right now. And then there are investment groups that are essentially buying up rooftops all over yeah. big urban yeah. to anticipate this. I think for, for urban air mobility with electric vehicles, the main challenge that people are talking about is getting the electric charge infrastructure up to the top of these skyscrapers. Because, you know, in order to do quick charge, you're going to need, you know, each of these chargers is something like an 800 kilowatt charger. And a lot of buildings just don't have that kind of power to the top and they're not even close enough to the nearest electrical substation. So I think that will actually be the limiting factor of how quickly eVTOL, uh, you know, vertiports, helipads can pop up. In our case, one, you know, because we're designing for long range, we're developing a hybrid electric system, so we don't need to charge, uh, which should allow us to, to be out there operating in a lot of places that definitely will not have this electric charge infrastructure anytime soon. I've forgotten that because I've built. I'm knocking some trees down on build one because I thought I'd increase the value of our house by putting in a vertiport, which is forcing <laughs> me to think about the implications of putting in a vertiport. And uh, I had I've forgotten the uh, the uh, the charging infrastructure, so that that's a mistake. So I'm afraid it is going to have to be an overnight stay uh, if, if you come to my place. Um, I, hope, I hope you've got a big family that needs to travel a lot at your house. Well, also, if you, if you superimpose the range of most of these craft uh, around where I live, um, mm. we ain't going anywhere, really. <laughs> um, but, it's, um, but yeah, well, and also the, run, the runawayness. I've been thinking, because we have, we have hectic big uh, storms in Africa. We even have rain down in Africa and um, in, in the afternoons. And, uh, and the runaway strategy, there's got to be a runaway from weather strategy for these machines and stuff like that uh, there's all sorts of stuff uh, maybe it wouldn't be as affected if it's cargo uh, it would be bad news but it wouldn't be as bad but yeah you wouldn't, wouldn't want to get trapped in weather so i yeah i i do wonder about all of this and i've ranted enough bruce someone else jump in yes yes um i've got a couple of questions there you've got a sounds like a pretty sound strategy for dealing with the regulatory framework that is you know build up a a safety case by logging a lot of incident-free flights and then using that to justify moving into higher risk operations. But um, I, I don't, will that work? Because if you look at the, for example, the recreational drone community, there are now over a million registered drone users in the USA, been flying drones for six years, and there's never been one person killed as a result of the recreational use of multi-reactor drones anywhere in the world, but regulators are not accepting that. And the airline pilots, for example, are saying, yes, but it's only a matter of time before something bad happens. So do you think you'll gain the necessary traction with your strategy? Because it certainly hasn't worked for the, the recreational community. 
sorry, is this a question for me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, you know, time will tell. I can't tell you 100% that we're going to sail through regulatory, um, but at least in the U.S., we're getting very positive feedback from the FAA about uh, about our approach. You know, from the, the first conversation I had with anybody at the FAA back when we started the company, they said, "Look, it's great that you have no passengers on board and that you can build a business in out in austere environments." Because when we look at the safety case, which that's the number one thing we care about, we're going to be taking a look at not only the airworthiness of the vehicle, but the missions, concept of operations. And if you can show that your mission risk is very low, that's going to be a much easier yes. So, I mean, time will tell. We're, we're out to, to prove that this, theory, this thesis is correct, but, um, but the feedback is good so far. BV loss is still a big thing, isn't it? I mean, you're getting approval to fly BV loss and any kind of useful cargo operation is going to be BV loss. And then you've got also the problem, you're probably not going to be flying below 500 feet. You'll be up there with GA aircraft, so you've got conspicuity issues, you've got all that sort of stuff. Uh, so um, how, how the FAA responded to all those challenges? Can yeah. I just just just, uh, just j j jump in? I know Joshua's got to go, so I will just bid him farewell. And uh, sorry. And then Thank we'll... you for having me. Too much fun. David, congratulations on the fundraise. Cheers, guys. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. And I'll, 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 I'll just want to say about the conspicuity and stuff like that. By by the almost by default, by having a larger, more useful payload over a greater range, you're going to need less cargo drones. So yes, conspicuity, ADSB, all that sort of a thing. Perhaps it'll be easier. And when when we all rule the earth and we get GA above two K and out of the way, a job will be a good. One. It'll be tickety boo. Sorry, over to you, David. Okay, so, yeah, so quick question, and David. How many sure. pages does your SORA manual have? Or don't you or aren't you guys going to, to submit with the EASA rules with SORA and SAIL? S O R A. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I I couldn't tell you how many pages it has right now. Um, you know, to be clear about where we are in our in our process, we are developing the aircraft. Um, we've we've done a number of Validation flights of subscale UAV systems that are, you know, representative of the aerodynamics and the controls strategy that we're deploying. Um, we've done a bunch of subsystem testing, so we do like powertrain testing, avionics, hardware in the loop. Um, we're we're still working our way through things like putting the SORA together and getting, you know, getting out there with it. So, um, you know, like any early stage company. We are doing kind of the, the most important things first, which is making sure that the aircraft is going to work, that it's going to fly, uh, and figuring out where we're going to deploy it first. So a lot of talks with customers right now. And and we all know, and it's very uh, all aviation. Anyone in aviation knows that an aircraft shall not fly until the weight of paperwork exceeds the all up weight of the aircraft. Uh, that's just I can, one of those I can vouch laws for of that. physics. That's that's just the law of physics. I can it? vouch for that because I'm already for a simple uh, X uh, uh, drone. I'm already beyond 100 pages, so uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, you can't fly. We'll get there. Right? Yeah, we'll get there. Check back in a couple months. Well, the, uh, so so exactly how, the the large scale machine. I'm going to read off of the Chaparral. Was it? I think it was called. Um, yes. Something something like that. Is is that flying or is that still a render? Um, the images that you see now are renders, and what we like I mentioned, the we're we're working our way up toward full system flights. We're coming up on that pretty quickly. Um, what we've done so far are subsystem flights of subscale versions of the aircraft and a bunch of uh, subsystem validation. So powertrain validation, cargo system validation. Um, we've got a hardware in the loop simulator that's running the full avionics suite. So we're basically, we, you know, we're testing the systems piecemeal while the, the full airframe gets put together. And, uh, and then we'll be running full scale flights this year. I'd love, love, love to see this in action at the next Lake Victoria Challenge. Plug it, I get in for that. Where it's not just prizes, but contracts waiting. Uh, Come on, Lake Victoria yeah. does not need a 200, 200 kilos payload. Uh, it or does. or does. 500, 500 case. 
of the yeah oh, absolutely it's the most populous rural area uh, rural, rural, rural area on earth um 35 million people live around the lake and uh the roads aren't very good so yeah no they, they, they've got their use cases usually, usually roads on lakes are not very good they're very flat they're very <laughs> very very flat they, they, you, certainly there's no hills involved um <laughs> yeah i mean the, a, a moment about the why like you know the reason that we want to do this is that we believe that expanding the reach of express logistics is valuable and you know for for us living in the bay area we get used to um, and it really like big population centers around the world, we get used to really high performing logistics and you can get same day and next day, two day deliveries. And I know from, from talking to the companies that provide these logistics that they're frustrated that they can't do this in more places. And I think when you have access to this, it's a convenience, it's a improves quality of life. And also we can do things not just like e-commerce, Type logistics, but there's um, food aid and disaster relief and relief to firefighters and all kinds of things that a heavy lift uh, autonomous aircraft system can provide that we're looking forward to doing. Yes, uh, somebody wanted us to do some flying up on the <laughs> up on the top. So we've got some mountains here, and the, and then to move batteries to, up on top of the mountains. He said, "Why don't we hire a helicopter so we can lift loads of batteries up there? Like, why, don't sure. we just, why don't we just use the helicopter then?" <laughs> but anyway, just, um, and I'm thinking also to I mean, when you were coming today, so I was speaking to a friend and we we're talking about Uganda. And, I don't know if you know in Uganda that the roads actually all go in. I mean, didn't didn't link the the infrastructure is terrible there because mm -hmm. if you have roads that can go through towns, then you can set out with your armies against against Didi from there. So we made all the roads go into a central hub. So to get from one place, you you have to go through the center to get across to other towns, mm -hmm. and that was a defensive thing. So to go at what is a short distance, maybe 60 kilometers in a straight line, it can be a six or seven hour journey because you've got to go into town and back out again. So, you know, there are there are all sorts of places. Um, Sounds like the Boston subway system. Is a, yeah, perhaps. So it's, um, yeah, Africa has a need for other countries has, and there's, there has to be white. Well, I mean, look at Zipline, they are, I thought it was madness to begin with, but now I'm, you know, I'm, I'm quite impressed with it. But they they have been out and operating, so they're getting a foothold in in a market mm. where um where where they have little opposition. So it's 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 really good for them for their business. Very few other people can say that. Um, yeah, no, I think good on them. I mean, it's um it's it shows that that deploying these systems for good in places where. You know, for better or for worse, the government can can write new things into into law pretty easily. Can be a way to get started. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we look forward to seeing it. Then we definitely look forward to seeing it. Yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> it's, it's coming. Yeah, no, it is. I do think this is one of the use cases that uh, of the many that have stood up over the years. I do think uh, the delivery is in some sort of the way to go, and there will be seven forty sevens converted out into. Airbus A380s, they will be converted out to fly to places mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere, full of cargo and uh, no people on board. Um, oh, Bruce has run away. That's unusual. <laughs> oh, he's back. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, what else has caught? Please stay with us, David. What else has caught everybody's eyes? Oh, let's go back to the Canberra thing. So, in Canberra, uh, a half million. Australian dollar drone was shot down in a rural part of ACT. ACT policing spokesman confirmed officers responded to, to the incident in Tennant. Have we heard about that, Bruce? Did anyone? I hadn't heard about that. And they they fantastically... Yep, it was it, the drone the wasn't trailer. half a million. The, the payload, payload was LIDAR. That's where all the money was, I think. Uh, okay. That'll be yep. it then. That'll do it. That's, that's, that's usually where the money is. It's not on the drone. It's on the, on the payloads. But this is interesting, isn't it? Because we've had we've had the media and to a degree, to a degree, some of the commercial drone operators sort of hammering the recreational drone community and we've got sort of vilifying drones and, and we've got industry, you know, the, the manned aviation industry vilifying drones. And now it's coming back to bite them a bit because when they want to do something with drones, people are shooting the damn things down. They're so hysterically scared of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, who knows? That'll, that'll well, come out of the wash one up. Uh, 
on the topic of shutting down uh, Portuguese government uh, beginning of January issued a new pr law proposal that would be absolutely crazy and last week after the show uh, it went to the parliament so everyone at the parliament uh, threw down the law so it didn't pass but um, on the topic of uh, uh, FAA, CASA and all that the local ANAC which is the Portuguese regulator I believe their um, uh, director is about to be fired because he also said that the new law that the government proposed was plain stupid so we might have we don't have a new drone law and uh, but uh, we have uh, a future to be fired director of FANAC so it is quite confusing at the moment and everybody and their dog threw down their um, opinion on the new drone law, including the lady that is the head of the privacy department uh, in Portugal, which said that the new law, crazy as it was, still wasn't crazy enough because it lacked regulation of sound capturing using drones. So, welcome to the world of politics. That's right, right, Louis. I know in New Zealand here, our Civil Aviation Authority has strongly resisted the registration of recreational drones. So now the government, having made no headway with CIA, is handing the whole matter over to our Ministry of Transport because they're far more malleable, they're closer to government, so they can be convinced by politicians to do what they want, not what's best for the industry and the airspace safety. And they're like, it's, you know, politicians, they're ruining the, ruining the world. They are, they are. We had the parliament and the, the law was thrown down by all parties except the, the party that is in charge in the government. So oh my god it was so crazy crazy law that no one would would have been able to to fly a, a parrot uh, or any kind of small drone uh, whatever it was well then, now you know why honest. i'm treating the laws solely as advisory not prescriptive i will just fly safely and if it's breach of the law then you take me to court and prove that what i did was unsafe that's my attitude Oh, come on, Bruce. We are getting old, so if they throw us out in the jail, it was a, it is a bonus for our families. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, maybe. But what I was going to say is we are definitely, we, we're at some, some, some inflection points, tipping points. I don't know what the business words are that people, people clever people use, but we're at a point where we're definitely at a point where our, our aviation regulators have perhaps identified some of the problems and are quite happy with it and beginning to work with it but our politicians all around the world are going oh yeah let's go jump on that bandwagon and they're getting in the way like they haven't been and if you're going to get a half million uh, australian dollar lidar shot off a drone and that has that has big implications and that's a company that was plainly making good money uh, with that system and they're going to want general aviation out of the way and this is pity joshua's gone but your altitude angel your um your Kitty Hawk, uh, they're, they're going to come into play and manned aviation is going to have to change its way of thinking. It is going to have to get out of the way or move on down the road or whatever. Um, I, think, I think that according to regulations, everyone, uh, all the politicians uh, got scared when they saw that uh, drone incident in Venezuela where they were trying to fly the, the drones to do to, that exploded. So that ring the bell on the politicians mind drones bombs uh, so they're trying to throw um, a big blanket over all the drones but that unbelievably was the, the excuse for, for folks in america to having to put their registration on the outside now rather than from anywhere wasn't it because it was because we could we could approach from <laughs> from a distance and detect what the registration was and not, not have to open it up and oh even nice. that that one from intel the open drone id or whatever it is called uh we via bluetooth uh come on it's uh, the guys that want to do harm won't, won't yeah. Give yeah. It yeah 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 but we don't we all support the french system isn't that what we want that one with the which one, morse code, one with the morse code flashing the, lights and oh the one we know uh, I, I was thinking on the drone the, the one that i saw on your site the guys that drove two nets 
from the yes. griffin the griffin yes uh, that that throws the net uh but the the offending drone has to be stopped for the, the, the net to catch it <laughs> <That's right. laughs> <Please wait. laughs> yeah. after my experience this morning all we need to do is grow more trees that'll stop the drones that would oh. that, 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 that was actually i mean if that's what we need if growing more trees is what we need to do to stop the the, the drone menace it wouldn't be a bad thing really would it all in all all oh, around we have uh, but there, there's a special a special uh race of of trees we have one on our flying field here uh which is a magnetic tree i don't know what happens with that tree because all the planes crash on that tree and the tree is on the corner of the flying field but all the planes like to be and are attracted to that tree Absolutely. so that tree also has uh branches made of foam but, well, uh, but, but we but this is a good time to bring Nicola in because we know that he he doesn't just use trees uh, catching trees oh. he he has catching mountains no, as well you, you and uh, so moving up in the world so did did the catching mountain win um, <clears throat> for the time being yes my friend was up there a few days ago and uh, sadly he couldn't find anything although he didn't cover the whole area because that place is huge funny thing is a day after that i flew the clouds up there i uh surveyed the area did um, pretty much repeated um the track where i flew with the crosswind with the clouds although keeping a bit higher <laughs> altitude so as not to uh, you know have a yeah, repeat yes. <laughs> yeah although now i did program a proper fail safe altitude uh to be reached so hopefully <clears throat> if something like this happens again actually i should have tried it i should have just gone further behind the mountain until i lost uh everything and should have just seen if it will ever pop up and that's to recap that was you looking for the white foam plane on snow at the top of a mountain <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Without, without actually being completely certain it's still up there. It was, yes. Yeah, because if it didn't plant itself well into the snow, there were some pretty strong winds the following couple of days, so they could have blown it uh, down the mountain into the forest. So I think I'm going to be surveying that area very, you know, very often and very detailed. And I uh, love that. I love the video of of uh, that two point whatever thing with on the tail again. I love your video with the camera on the tail. <laughs> what a fantastic the piece of the camera! Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, too bad V tail planes make it kind of difficult to uh, put a camera up there. But yeah. you know the the crosswind would have been nice with one of those uh, on the tail but it's lost in the mountains so for the time being the clouds is back in action and funny thing is i had to do three flights before i actually got any 4k video <clears throat> to the ground because first time around i flew with my highest quality recording camera that i have problem was the battery uh was dead so uh it wouldn't really work all that well. It would start recording and in a few seconds it would shut off. And I only realized that after landing. So that's, you know, roughly 45 to 50 minutes of an amazing flight because I didn't just go up there to do a few passes over the supposed crash site. I also um, tried to, like on purpose, try to crash the plane into the mountain by flying too low to the ground considering where i was and how far away from home i was but you know all went fine then i land and then there's nothing on the on the card so then next day i get another camera and i do the same flight only this time i try to get down to the ground even closer guess what camera's battery died about 10 minutes into the flight so another awesome dvr recording but that's about it <clears throat> So then I did a third flight, the exact same. It, it was getting ridiculous. So three, three flights, exactly the same, with different cameras. And finally, the uh, Firefly 6S yielded some results. And I've got, a, uh, like, not HD, 4K recordings of that flight. 
So you're going to see that in the coming days. Ah. And then what, will you will you use will you be pouring over that and trying to find the model with that, or is it just too? Yeah, hard? I'm gonna no, I'm gonna go uh, over uh, the section where I pass over the uh, supposed crash side frame by frame, and I'm gonna try and look for it. I don't think I'm gonna see anything if I just look for a different color because I didn't paint my crosswind. It's got a few uh, gray plastics on it, but I was pretty high so <clears throat> probably i'm just gonna look for you know weird shapes into the snow something like that that might stand out otherwise i'm gonna have to just because that place is literally behind the mountain from my viewpoint so to get low yeah. low to the ground i will need to be like on the other side of the mountain. And at some point I might just do that or I might program an auto mission to follow the terrain uh, like what, 40, 50 meters above it and just do a few passes over there and uh, perhaps maybe climb up the mountain a little bit into the forest and then fly with the Phantom to see if I can spot anything because that also has a nice camera on it. Yeah. But yeah, it will be it will be a fun spring. <clears throat> <laughs> and Bruce, um, Bruce, are you busy um, uh, fixing bits of wire and fiddling with stuff that you found in the bins? The dumpster that no, is. no. This is my retro blackout mini quad rebuild that I'm ah. working on here. But just thinking, you know how you like to have the camera on the tail, and, and Nicola was saying, well, V-tails make it difficult. No, opportunity. Put two cameras, get 3D. Yes, three, I was thinking that as well. Yeah, VR. That's the VR drone. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There'd be about some of them be about the right width as well, wouldn't they? Oh, yes. Will it have uh, AI and um, blockchain? Uh, I believe. Uh, don't we call Don't we call AI something else now? Uh, I think. No, machine call... learning. Machine learning. Deep machine learning. Yeah. But deep learning. I wouldn't yeah. use AI. I wouldn't use. I wouldn't use blockchain because that's crashing everywhere. Yes. 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 No. Very much. Yes. Uh, all right. Well, look. I mean, does anyone else have anything else? It's a bit early tonight. I'm... Oh, no, just um, the UK situation with their extra draconian laws. They've added that you know, as I said, in my rant. They've added drones to fire. Uh, what is it? Um, explosives, drugs, firearms, and acid as something that they can search you for because it's so dangerous. These drones, terrible things. I know that that is a well, yeah, t terrible to to club them in with guns and everything and knives. <laughs> and that's it, as you said. It's not a very good look, is it, really, for the industry? Is um, it any wonder people shoot these damn things down? They're so dangerous. Well, yeah, it's just madness, isn't it? I, yeah, yeah, who, who, yeah I, I'm, I'm, I struggle. I struggle. Now, Gary, you really have to struggle to get good laws now in the UK. Yeah. You have a, a personal interest on that. <laughs> oh, well, no, yeah. Yes. I thought it'd be ironic if, yeah, because my eldest uh, flew out there. He's gone to study uh, there uh, this week. Yeah, I thought it'd have been ironic if he got delayed flying into Heathrow or something like that. Um, but we that's all gone very quiet, hasn't it? That's all disappeared, that whole Gatwick thing. Easy whizzy, gone. Oh, have uh, you seen that there's a crowd advertising on YouTube, D-Drone or something? Yes, I've like, seen you can that. Get, get them I've on, Gary. I'd like to ask advert. them some questions. Yes. Oh, my God. Yep. Oh, my God. Don't invite them. Don't invite them. But did you notice? Did you notice on the website, the first picture, the guy doesn't even know which way around to hold a Sharpie. I wouldn't trust him. <laughs> sounds, sounds like one of my videos <laughs> but yes that um, that video is uh, i'm glad it also came into your feed i was pretty horrified it doesn't it's not very good for the industry i think we've got to be a little bit careful of, and have uh, you guys seen the yeah. great the great show that is the grand tour with clarks and Hammond yep. and may and i guess there is some manufacturer from china that might not be very happy to see uh, his top of the, the line, drone. his top of the line industrial drone uh, with flamethrowers. That, yeah, yeah. Not, but they use it to clear the power lines, don't they? Uh, apparently, yeah. yeah. Apparently, so Mad RC is saying there's over a thousand signatures on the petition. Uh, I, I assume that's the DJI one. Uh, what's it, Node? The Node uh, petition. 
about the new regs, but that, yeah, I'm sadly I don't. don't one thousand, it's not good enough. You no. crank, crank it to one hundred thousand, and you might have a chance. Yeah, that's absolutely. that's the problem. Uh, we are, we see that everywhere. Ian, he's had a, he's had a busy day. He's had a busy day. Uh, he did email me earlier, so he had a busy day, and he's gone to bed. He went to bed early, apparently. I don't know what she's called, but that's what he said. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it's, <laughs> but it's uh, better the bed than the shed, eh? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> let's let's call it a muse. Um, oh, very good. Oh, yes. Perhaps. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps that's the reason why uh, why I misjudged on the first two flights as to which camera to use. My muse wasn't there with me, so yeah, I yeah, I really hope. <laughs> but Nicola, oh, now he's gone. Yeah, no, so, well, there we are. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> it, and as if by magic, <laughs> yeah, his muse <laughs> pulled the plug. <laughs> I oh, think it, it was his plane that crossed, uh, cut the wires, but okay. Absolutely. Now I was going to tell him that if he wants to fight the plane, uh, he'll have to get a good camera and do some good planning mission to... I was going to tell you, if you want to fight the plane, get a decent camera on the plane and do a proper survey job uh with a resolution of around a centimeter per, per pixel or less uh so that you can do the that that survey because yeah looking at the monitor looking at the monitor uh, you have to go high resolution and try yeah. and I know filter if you're working with snow i'm not I'm not counting on uh, seeing anything on the monitor that's analog i'm just i'm the idea is to uh, review the uh, 4K footage afterwards, but I might get something like decent and, like I said, put it on the plane and uh, do a mission, like an auto mission, 40, 50 meters above the terrain and then review that. And there is a, a decent area to cover, but still not that big because once it gets to the trees, it will get stuck in there no matter how fast the wind but like I said, the muse is very important, and I hope next time around she will be present. <laughs> it will take me quite a lot of time, actually, because both flights are bloody long, and charging yeah. the lithium batteries takes time. So, yeah, having, the, having my muse there would save a lot of time. Uh, don't forget to get a good, uh, 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 good enough and big enough SD card to... Um, yeah. yeah. No, we're all taking turns and going. All right, look, we've we've rambled on to just about the top of the hour. So I'm going to say going once, going twice. Does anybody else have anything else? David, thank you very, very much for taking the time to join us. I'm excited to follow your your platform. Um, I, I do think you're, I personally think you're, you're, you're aiming at the right right target and uh, yeah. and hopefully it keeps keeps sure. keeps going that way for you and hopefully we'll have, have you back when you've you've got the big one flying and we can uh, we can sure. find out some more about that that'll be great yeah, no, happy to thanks for having me on happy to come back at the right time um i think the whole world is is figuring out how we're going to live side by side with robots and more autonomy so you know it's there's some some Rocky beginnings in some cases, like the kind of regulatory taking some time to get mm -hmm. figured out. But mm -hmm. I'm pretty confident that we we can we all collectively can kind of lead the industry forward to a spot where, you know, everybody gets to do these useful things and it's safe and accepted. So we'll get yeah. there. I think you're right. I think we're at tip. Yeah. I've decided that I will live with robots with, by using the miracle of gin. Uh, and perhaps the odd beer <laughs> as well. Uh, that's that's how I'm going to learn to live with them. It'll, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. That's fine. Once you know, with autonomy, you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to be in control. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't remotely pilot that way. But uh, autonomous systems, no problem. <laughs> yeah. No, it's it's coming, and we are definitely. We're definitely at a. a, a a, a tipping point or inflection point or whatever point it is of people's attitudes and regulators. It's all coming together. 10, 20 years time, we'll, we'll forget 
that it was ever like this. And hopefully in model aircraft and stuff, that will be left alone again. They'll just be allowed to go back to where they were. Um, Nicola, thank you. We look forward to your next video. Uh, we haven't seen the helicopter, have we? We haven't seen the helicopter for ages, Louis. What happened? To oh, that big helicopter came out today. I should have mentioned that. Did, did we all see that? The uh, drone, drone delivered Canada with their 180 kilo lifting one. So where's your one like that, Louis? Oh my God! I want to do a 180 kilos. Forget it. Uh, <laughs> I already struggle. I will. I already struggle with a, a plane 700 uh, sized Ellie, which is eight kilos, yeah. uh, and uh, it's already frightening enough. Uh, but uh, now, I, 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 just before the show, I was seeing uh, an advertisement from Horizon Hobby on their new micro Ellie. Uh, that is very, very interesting. Uh, uh, Horizon, okay, does consumer grade stuff, uh, toy stuff, but also do some uh, good RC uh, gear. And they didn't left, uh, they didn't uh, leave the helicopters lingering. So they're bringing some new technology for their small helicopters. Quite, quite I'm, interesting I'm helicopter. Using it right now. Is it micro or mini? Uh, uh, Nan uh, S2 is a new one, is the, the latest one, is the Nano successor. Nano uh, S2, yeah, that's it. Quite, quite interesting. Uh, little birds, uh, okay, it's a toy, uh, but will fly well below the no autonomy, just a uh, plain RC helicopter. Quite interesting. Uh, the, those guys do, I, uh, uh, okay, I. I revamped my my RC uh, hobby, uh, and I got myself a MCPX. So it was a crazy uh, wild birds flying. Um, but uh, it's nice to see that some some manufacturers still investing on the normal RC stuff. So not everything. Okay, uh, it comes from China, but not all manufacturers are based in China. Yes, true. Yeah, no, it looks collective pitch has been asked in, in the comments. It looks 3D maneuvers. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I've, I've it's got a, a, a regular um, helicopter, but uh, on a very small package 150 milliamps battery, yeah. so it's very small. Yeah. Jesus. And, uh, talk, about, talk about battery raping. <laughs> <laughs> These are going to have to be some pretty high C. <laughs> no. No, the, the, yeah. the, usually these kinds of helicopters, uh, they are very light. Because helicopters are usually very light, not like a, a drone. So you don't, need, you don't need crazy C uh, capabilities on the batteries. Bruce is making a video while we're doing this. 32 grams, 32 grams, yeah. it says it is. So that's well under his, his 250. Yeah, that looks like a four, four to five minute flight times. 1S, 45C. Is that the MCPX, Actually, Bruce? Bruce, what is that? Um, no, I'm just filming this. It's just ah. a mini <laughs> 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 very small. He's just making his next video. Is he? I mean, yeah. If I was going to film something really small, I'd have my trousers off by now. Uh, actually, <laughs> actually, on the topic of sub uh, 250 gram stuff, Volantix will be coming out with some pretty interesting models in the coming weeks or months. Not sure exactly. I think when a lot of manufacturers will actually, in, in wake of the way regulation is going, I think two, sub yeah. 250 is going to be very, very big. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. kind of strange, isn't it? How Probably. ironic. <laughs> See what you did there. See what you did. Yeah, yeah. No, it is. It's, it... Yeah, planes equipped with, uh, you know, FPV, Wi-Fi, uh, return to home, etc. All within those uh, 250 grams, which is interesting, an interesting yeah. direction. But one thing that I've noticed. Uh, with these talks, guys, is that when you talk about regulations and every time there's something new, especially for the UK, it seems like they're just going down, like downhill. Like they 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 trying to see just with with how much crazy they can get away with. <clears throat> but I'm, I want to suggest a coping mechanism for those um, 
that actually, and are actually. I know what you're going to say. You're going to say muse. You're going to say muse. Oh no 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 <laughs> no no no. But by, by the people that feel affected by those regulations, every time they um, try to pass something even crazier, just think about this: you voted for Brexit. No, not only Brexit. Uh, come on, <laughs> I, I, we didn't vote for Brexit, <laughs> and, and, and we get the crazy lady from from the the, the data protection <laughs> committee asking for uh, some some uh, regulations for the drones. Uh, come on, it's not only Brexit. No. We voted no. for 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 the government. We voted for the. No. Not you, the but are, the people affected doing... by the UK regulations, they voted for Brexit, and then they say, well, uh, if I could, I would take that vote back. But then uh, are you really surprised that that government is trying to, you know, do that with the drone industry? Well, uh, what's Nicolai, Brexit? You're part, you're part of EU. It's a serial. You want, so you you want, you want <laughs> like, what is going your way. Uh, your nice flights your nice flights around the mountain and uh, in front of the mountain, behind the mountain, with or without news. Into the mountain, have, yes. Have, 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 their, have their days counted. So that's uh, what I'm telling uh, you. The best, about that. the best coping mechanism is just to do what I'm doing and consider all regulations. If they're going to be that bad, then compliance is going to be an issue and demonstrate that by treating them all as advisory and just make sure you fly <laughs> safely. And as far as regulations go, well, yeah, let them have their regulations, but not going to affect me. Uh, well, um, I, I was talking to some, somebody here, at a national newspaper here, and, and I was trying to get the point over that our regulations that are so harsh are just forcing non-compliance. And that, to me, is, is the worry. Uh, uh, but uh, in, in defense of, of aviation regulators, they're, as I've said earlier, their hands are being forced by politicians now, and there's yeah. not a lot they can do. It's, it's changed. A few years ago, a few years ago, when we were just dealing with aviation regulators, it was all going nicely. But now, you. <laughs> it's, you know. I it, guess we'll I, see. Well, I, well, I think it'll it probably in ten years' time the fuss will be gone. The the the, the, the glare and shine will be off all the multi rotors that are people buying. But have you known politicians? Them. How many politicians are eager to repeal bad regulations? They're not. They don't care. Once they're there, they're there. It's much easier to have them to have them reversed. True. Yes, that's a fair um, point. That's just, a fair just, point. just a, a, a note before we we go away. Uh, just just got a new paper uh, advisory that is under consultation from the Yarus Group, which certification specification yes. for UAA, UAS. So, yes. guys, uh, things That's are it. getting tight. And what's the new acronym? I've forgotten. There's two letters before something UAS. Isn't it? CS. 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 That's it. CS UAS or CS UAS. We it'll, have it'll, Sora, it'll change we week. have sales, yeah. we have Sora, we have sales, and now this, and there will be the one from the pilots, and very soon uh, we might have the ones for the electronics on board the drones, and then the uh, code running for the on the those electronics. So yeah. things are getting tighter and tighter and tighter for this. Do you think um, we we could start um, an acronym factory or something? I reckon there's money to be made uh, in in, in the, coming the up BS, with a lot more. The BS the BS acronym BS UAS. Yeah, BS UAS. Yeah. There you are. You've gone, and how much are you going to charge for that one? Um, oh, it's, right. <laughs> It's, I'm sure we can make some money out of all this somehow, increasing the amount of paperwork. <laughs> anyway, let's go. Let's go, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, dear um, viewer, wherever you might be in the world. It's lovely to have you along. Don't forget to join us again at 2100 GMT next week where we'll talk further nonsense. <laughs> and uh, have a we'll safe do. weekend. Yeah, we will definitely talk nonsense, will we? Be safe, no. whatever you're doing. If you're flying, no. don't crash. Don't don't be hold like. On, hold on, hold on, okay. hold on. Oh, well, oh, yeah. okay. Don't don't tune out. Stay stay tuned for next week for another episode of 
Nikolai tries to fight this plane. Oh, yes. It's going to be the whole yeah. summer, isn't it? It's going to be a yeah. summer season. <laughs> so, children, That's... get onto Google Earth now and you could win. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Can, yeah, we need a little, we need a, like a, a football thing, don't we? Like, no, X no, marks a spot. let's do a competition. Let's do a competition. Uh, uh, Nikolai gives us a central point and the best search pattern for the, the uh, white plane on the white snow, snow wins. <laughs> <laughs> There's an idea. Like trying to hunt for snowmen in a snowball fight. I mean, a snowball fight out there. So, you know, it's, no, it's, all right. Yeah, and that's, special prize. Special prize for the guy that finds the yeti. Absolutely, mm. extra bonus, please. Oh, definitely. Yeah, just follow the yellow snow. Yeah, yeah never, never <laughs> eat yellow snow. Never eat yellow <laughs> snow, Bruce. <laughs> go once, go eat twice. Dear viewers, everybody, thanks very much. Look after yourself. See you next week. Bye-bye, all. Bye-bye.